We didn't really have a video for this Saturday. We were thinking of stuff we wanted to see and didn't get to see, so I just thought I was gonna do another director video. You guys seem to like that last time I did it. Stanley Kubrick is, I think, an obvious choice for this. First off, his filmography isn't massive so that you don't have to see a, fi try to find a bunch of movies that you haven't seen. I mean, I feel like every person who like falls in love with movies gravitates towards Stanley Kubrick at some point, but a seriously entertaining filmmaker and has a great variety and really dipped into so many different genres that there's such a wealth of classic fantastic movies from so many different eras of filmmaking. I do have some strong opinions about a couple of them. I will certainly talk about it. Let's get to the list. The movies I haven't seen, Fear and Desire, that was like his student film. I mean, I don't think a lot of people have seen Fear and Desire. Killer's Kiss, that's an early film as well. I haven't seen that one. Weirdly, I haven't seen Spartacus. I don't know why. I think it's also one that he kind of disowned. So of the 10 I've seen, at the bottom of the list is Lolita. I think Lolita is a fine movie. It's I have my issues with it considering, you know, the source material and how it was adapted. I mean, again, it's not really an adaptation of the book. I sort of did a video about this on the main channel, less about the movie, but more about like the marketing and general uh, publication of Lolita. So I do think that it's a very interesting film, but again, you kind of have to separate it from its source material in a, in a way. And it is, it's not a pleasant watch, you know, in any way. So, but I certainly couldn't put it any higher on the list. Number nine, I have Full Metal Jacket. I like all of these movies, you know, but Full Metal Jacket, for whatever reason, just happens to be at the uh, lower end of the list. No hate against it. I think there are some great performances in it. I actually think the second half of the movie is fantastic. I know at the time, critics were like, hey, the, the first half is great. Second half just falls apart, you know, when they're doing the the fighting in, in the city. Um, but it is a, a really depressing movie. It's it's not a, a fun movie, obviously, but it has that kind of like late period Kubrick, austere, wide angle feel about it. It's good, but it's it's definitely not like one of his, his best movies, I think. Uh, let's see, then we have The Killing. I haven't seen this one in a while, but I remember really liking it. And it's a classic noir heist story, just with a fantastic ending. I love the cast. It's a Kubrick movie where it, it definitely feels like it's more in the old Hollywood tradition, regardless of, you know, who directed it or the style or whatever. It's just a great story and a, a, a great, like, pulpy um, uh, crime story. Then we have A Clockwork Orange. Compelling movie, really interesting. In a way, I, I think of it as, like, Kubrick's most Kubrick movie, you know, dealing with the themes of kind of the alienation brought on from modern times. The conflict between knowledge and lack of knowledge or self-knowledge, you know, uh, it's an uncomfortable movie because it comes to some uncomfortable conclusions about society, about how we treat those who are, we may consider evil, you know, incredible movie. Then Eyes Wide Shut. Now, I <laughs> I love Eyes Wide Shut because in a way it seems like the most illogical, the most bold of his movies, especially his later movies. There's not a a real internal logic in, in a sense where there, there's like a dream logic and that's, that's how I kind of connect it to 2001 in that sense. I think it's almost like the most stylistically or like structurally experimental. A beautiful movie, just incredibly shot, just captivating in a really unsettling way. Interesting film. And I get why people weren't crazy about it when it came out because I think it is like a departure from like some of his earlier movies. And you think like, well, it took him so many years to make this movie. And then you see it and you're like, really? That it took that long? <laughs> you know, it's not some crazy, you know, sci-fi. It's just about this uh, couple and subterranean world of like the mind and jealousies and world of the ultra rich and you know people are gonna use this movie forever as for conspiracy theories and I think Kubrick is just I think people <laughs> come to Kubrick movies with like well he was a genius and he only made these movies and he was so methodical and he took so many takes and it's like people will look at mistakes in in his movies and be like he did that intentionally like he did everything intentionally it's like he wasn't God, <laughs> you know, like, I think that's where, where some people take the Kubrick adoration too far. Like, he was just a person who um, made mistakes and wanted to make really good movies. I don't think he was putting secret codes into it. I mean, maybe he was putting in some, you know, illusions or, or, or secret stuff in there, but I don't think, you know, I don't think it's that deep in that way. I think they're deep in a, like a, an emotional level. Then we have Barry Lyndon. I might rewatch this again soon and see if I even rank it higher because I do love this movie. It seems to have like a kind of renaissance in terms of everyone going crazy about Barry Lyndon. Man, Barry Lyndon. Everyone wants to talk about Barry Lyndon. Everyone, I, it's a, it's a gorgeous movie. 
it's super slow downfall of a, of a person who, who ends up not really having a soul. And it, it is like a very suspenseful movie in a way. I mean, I think that's what, don't think about it because it is so slow. It has a very deliberate pace, but there's like this suspense in everything that happens in every m- movement and every motion. It, it has a, it, it's unlike any other movie. And I guess you could say also it is one of his most bold, you know, out there movies. Um, fantastic. Man, what would we do if we had Waterloo? That'd be great. Apparently Steven Spielberg's trying to make a mini series of Kubrick's Waterloo script. So that'll be interesting if that ever happens. Number four, Paths of Glory. I don't know if this is just sentiment because this was one of the early Kubrick movies I saw. And just seeing those shots of the trenches, Kirk Douglas walking through the trenches in the camera, like, I mean, I'd remember, I remember watching like old classic Hollywood movies and, you know, actors standing around in a room and nothing feels super alive and vivid. Like they do in maybe more modern movies or movies from the 70s, you know. Of course, I appreciate movies like that now, the old classic Hollywood style, you know, Mike, Michael Curtiz, all that, you know, the, the studio system kind of look. But when you watch a movie like Paths of Glory or even The Killing, you know, you see it stretching, you see him taking these chances and, and kind of just devastating emotional, like there's a raw emotional power to that movie that you don't get so on the surface of in his later movies. It makes sense that Spielberg loves this movie, especially because it, it does have that like open emotional core to it, you know, at the end. And it's a very angry, uh, bitter movie, but it kind of an outlier, I think, in terms of his filmography uh, because of that. And again, you know, about humans in a mechanized system, people turning into machines in a way, you know, interesting movie for sure. Love it. You know, at this point, these three movies are interchangeable for me. It just depends on the day. They're so different. I mean, we have a comedy, we have a horror movie, we have a sci-fi movie. I think you know which ones I'm talking about, but which order are they in? Number three, I have Dr. Strangelove. It feels like the best movie ever made. I've probably seen it more than any of his other movies. It's so rare for movies, especially from the 60s. You watch some comedies, like mainstream Hollywood comedies from the 60s. It's like, oh God. I mean, watch some Jerry Lewis movies. I mean, there's some good bits in Jerry Lewis movies, but you can't watch the whole thing. Thing. It's dreadful, but you know, and comedy is is something again that like changes over time, and it's really hard to ca- to get something that's timeless. And this movie does like it's incredible, just the performances, and you can rewatch it and find funny things in it. Still, it's so dry <laughs> and so God. I wish Kubrick had made more straight up comedies, you know, Sterling Hayden giving like one of the funniest performances, obviously Peter Sellers giving those performances, just amazing. And then obviously George C. Scott, like just, it's amazing watching him on screen. And apparently Kubrick would have him do like different takes of varying energy. And, and George C. Scott always wanted to downplay it and play it more grounded. Kubrick would always say, okay, give me one where you just go crazy. And he would always use that take apparently. And it works so well because everyone in the movie is so grounded. Everything is so put together and and neat. And and it's shot so beautifully. And it could be like a serious film about nuclear war. And then you have George C. Scott just playing the most ridiculous general. Like, I mean, I, I love it. I love everything about it. The only downside is maybe like the plane stuff flying around in the plane is drags a little bit. I mean, I, I watched it when I was really young and I still, you know, it, it, I just kept rewatching it because there's something so perfect about it and mysterious as well. It, there's just that kind of like personality behind the camera. You get a sense of Kubrick's real personality just kind of winking at you uh, it, with every shot, which sometimes I feel like he tries to be so objective in a way with his camera to try to just capture things. And I wouldn't say objective, but just trying to remove himself, um, his personality from it in a way and just like be the material. And I think that Dr. Strangelove has maybe the most of his like personality, perhaps. Number two is The Shining. Uh, I take back my previous statement about Dr. Strangelove. I've definitely seen The Shining more than any of these other movies. It's a perfect movie, I think. (laughs) It doesn't have a lot of the baggage of the other ones. Like, it, it almost feels like it could just be, like, a horror movie. You can just have a horror movie, all the elements about domestic abuse and everything. And, and it's it's very interesting when you read the novel and see the movie and how it takes the ideas in the novel and kind of puts them to another level and, and addresses different things. And I think the movie, you know, what's great about the movie is the ambivalence of, you know, uh, is it a ghost story? Is it a story just straight up about a, an abusive 
person, you know, so it under the below the surface, super dark and, and really um, a disturbing movie. But it's also kind of um, funny in a way that is like it want it's it kind of like lets itself be a little crazy and, and weird, like the title cards and like the way the music slams on the title cards. Like that was the only time I jumped watching the movie for the first time was when it was like Wednesday. And that stuff is hilarious. There's something to be said about like Jack Nichols, Jack Nicholson's performance. I mean, Shelley Duvall's performance is like great but i feel like hers is like basically way more grounded in in that you watch jack nicholson and he's doing like an old time over the top like it it reminds me of nicholas cage and what nicholas cage tries to do in a lot of these movies where he's like reaching into like he, he's not just doing like a naturalist performance or, or like you think about like acting changing after brando but you know nicholson was doing something that was just like going back to silent era i think and um, beyond just living in the moment and doing and being natural you know so it's just it's a timeless movie and the fact that it has hung on for so long when it's not not like full of jump scares it's just a mysterious weird movie that it just captures your imagination everything about the set the costumes the just the era the i mean it, it it's amazing like i i can watch it so many times it's it's a really just timeless and uh, wonderful movie so yeah that's just the shining number one it's it's not a surprise it's 2001 a space odyssey and i i debate about like putting it as my my number one still i think that it is like a sentimental thing as well because this was, I mean, at the time before I ever got like serious into movies and explored um, like older films and stuff when I was, you know, like in middle school, I was super, I was just a reader. I read everything I could get my hands on and I was really into science fiction and I read the book 2001 A Space Odyssey by Arthur C. Clarke before I saw the movie. Actually, I checked out the movie once from the library and it was just a gray screen playing this music that I didn't even know was music. And I thought it was broken. I literally thought that the DVD was broken and I just <laughs> I just brought it back, not realizing that was, you know, the uh, the prologue, just the uh, the overture or whatever it's called. But once I read the book, and I then I could really put the movie together in a way I couldn't before. I was just like, I didn't have the patience for it. And I think a lot of people do. You know, it's, it's a really challenging movie. It, it demands a lot from the audience. Create like this cosmic metaphysical story you can interpret it in so many ways again it's about like man becoming machine it's about you know man versus nature it's it's like metaphysical journey of like the human spirit um you know it, you could look into it in so many ways and i think that's why the movie is so beloved and the book helped me you know when i was a kid because it helps me like okay so this is the aliens are doing this and they're elevating the humans and but now when i watch it you know i try to put that all out of my brain the, i love the book for what it is you know I love the book series too, the other books. I, I even love 2010, uh, the movie, as well as the book. So I'm really into that. But when I watch the movie, I try to think of it as just its own thing. Don't even think about the lore, the aliens. Like it's just a visual, almost spiritual experience. It is so important to me, you know? Like after watching that movie fully, after reading the book and being in awe. And I remember my dad like watched some of it with me, you know, and like fell asleep through part of it. And he was like, damn, that's still as boring as I remember. And I was like, that was amazing. And and I, I pretended I didn't like it, you know, like, oh, that was like stupid. It wasn't as good as the book. Like, but the images, the music, like it just stuck with me. And though, I mean, Kubrick could do that. I think that's why so many people flock to his movies because in each one of his movies, there are those moments that are just amazing. The, the, perfect combo of image and music and actor and just iconic images in all of his movies it's it's stunning and um you know when i was in high school i got I, in la I, I went and saw like the kubrick exhibit at the la uh, county museum of art and uh, they had all of these props and stuff typewriter from the shining and that was a really big deal for me at the time um yeah i mean stanley kubrick one of the all-timers i mean no no brainer yeah i don't know it's fun talking about him and let me know like your rankings of stanley kubrick movies i'm really curious i'm sure a lot of you would put 2001 up there at up top too but maybe not i don't know thank you for watching we'll be back next week with our regular scheduled content have a good one everyone bye bye